Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm also the area chair for uh, bioimage informatics and visualization here at ISMB. Um, our first speaker in the session today will be Michael Brent from Washington University, uh, who will be telling us about mapping functional transcription factor networks from gene expression data. Michael. Thank you. Like a lot of people, I'd like to be able to answer the question, which transcription factors regulate each gene? You might think that we would be able to answer this question, at least for the model yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, given that most transcription factors in yeast have been subjected to CHIP-CHIP or CHIP-Seq, and deletion strains for most transcription factors have been subjected to expression profiling by at least two different technologies. Unfortunately, these two data sources do not agree well at all. The typical overlap between the genes whose promoters are bound by a given transcription factor and those whose expression level changes when that transcription factor is deleted is about 3 to 5 percent. It seems that uh, CHIP is finding many non-functional binding events. And perhaps that uh, gene expression uh, analyzed in this way is finding many indirect uh, targets of transcription factors. But since uh, CHIP is a difficult, finicky experiment, we decided to see if we could get more information, more knowledge, out of the expression profiles of transcription factor deletion strains. To do that, we developed a method called net profit that scores all possible transcription factor target interactions by a combination of two things. The first is a lasso regression coefficient for explaining the expression level of the target as a function of the expression of the transcription factor. And the second is a log odds that the target is differentially expressed when the transcription factor is deleted. This uh, method requires only expression data, um, which is a very nice feature since expression profiling is an easy commodity method. We wanted to evaluate the ability of net profit to predict the direct targets of transcription factors and compare it to that of CHIP. So we took PWM models of binding specificity and calculated for each gene the potential of each transcription factor to bind that gene's promoter. The PWMs are derived from uh, protein binding microarray data, so they're completely independent of both the chip data and the expression data. For the top 4,000 net profit predicted targets, we um, calculated the, uh, the, the percentage that were supported by, the bind by binding potential um, at three different levels of stringency for what counts as sufficient binding potential. The results are shown here in red. And we then made the same calculation for the chip-chip data with the results shown in blue. At every stringency level, the net profit targets showed greater, substantially greater support uh, from binding potential than the chip-chip targets. And this is really remarkable because net profit doesn't know anything about promoter sequences or binding. It's using only expression data, whereas CHIP is specifically designed to measure binding. So since the top 4,000 predictions looked so good, we decided to go much deeper into the list and look at, oops, and look at the top 40,000 predictions. We found that the uh, at the highest stringency level for binding potential support, 11% of the top 4,000 net profit predictions were supported, and only 9,000, I mean, only 9% of all 30,000 chip interactions in the TNET and yeast tract databases were supported by binding potential. So net profit recovers more total edges than chip. It seems to be both more sensitive and more specific. On the left, you see the same measure of binding, uh, uh, binding potential support for net profit for each bin of 40,000 of 4,000 transcription factors from the top 4,000 uh, down to 40,000. And you can see that this nearly monotonic 
uh, decrease in support as you go down the net profit list shows that the net profit score is a good predictor of support from binding potential. On the right here, we kind of held our noses and pretended that CHIP could be used as a gold standard for evaluating net profit. And again, you see the same nearly monotonic decrease, suggesting that net profit score is also a good predictor of CHIP support. Now, the results I'm showing you here um, were uh, calculated using a very broad uh, collection of data sets. And so uh, I wanted to see what would happen if we used only a single uh, data collection, the data published by WHO and I are microarray data from 2007. And the result is that net profit still beats CHIP, but it doesn't do quite as well as we do when we have the full array of available data sets. Next, we turn to see if we could identify new functions for transcription factors that could not be identified from the existing chip data. So we did a growth enrichment analysis for the net profit predicted targets of each transcription factor. And then we did the same analysis for the chip targets of each transcription factor. And we removed any go terms that were identified by chip. After eliminating redundancies, we were left with 44 functions that could be identified by net profit, but not by chip. Two thirds of those were supported by other types of data, mostly mutant phenotypes. Two were supported by data from homologs and other species, and 13 were completely novel. Among the most interesting completely novels is a transcription factor called EDS1, uh, for which no known function, uh, no function was known at all. And we discovered and then later experimentally verified that EDS1 is a specific repressor of genes in the lysine biosynthesis pathway. So I think we were able to draw some lessons from net profit that may apply beyond the specific net profit algorithm. Those are that uh, differential expression is much more powerful for identifying direct targets than regression is. And as a corollary to that, uh, data from single transcription factor perturbations is much more useful than data from perturbations such as environmental perturbations that affect many transcription factors at once. The most significant responders to perturbation of a transcription factor are most likely to be its direct targets. And differential expression data can reveal direct binding better than in vivo binding data can and it's a heck of a lot easier to generate. We also compared net profit to two other algorithms for mapping regulatory networks from gene expression data, uh, Inferlator and Genie3. And we selected these because they were winners of uh, previous dream competitions for inference, network inference from expression data, and they were available to us. So we calculated this, we applied all the algorithms to the same data set, and we took the top 4,000 predictions from each algorithm and evaluated them according to support by PWM binding potential, support by chip, and support by both uh, PWM and chip. And by all measures, net profit uh, 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 performed significantly better than these other methods. So what did we do differently that allowed us to perform better? One thing is we used a global shrinkage parameter for lasso, whereas Inferlator uses one parameter for each of 6,000 genes, and therefore may have overfit these shrinkage parameters. We also weighted differential expression evidence heavily relative to regression evidence, whereas Inferlator uses differential expression only as a filter on regression. So for example, if there were a target gene that was strongly differentially expressed when a transcription factor is deleted, but there wasn't good overall correlation between the expression level of the transcription factor and the target, we would still call it a good prediction, whereas Inferlator would reject it. Finally, we weighted evidence of activation more heavily than evidence of repression, reflecting the fact that eukaryotes generally have more activators than repressors. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and tell you about how net profit can be applied to map the network that regulates a specific biological function in a 
scenario where you have to generate the gene expression data yourself as you go. We collaborated with the Tamara Deering lab to study regulation of the size of the polysaccharide capsule of a pathogenic fungus called Cryptococcus neoformans. Cryptococcus um, has a capsule that is small when it's living out in the environment, but when it enters the mammalian host, the capsule grows large. And it has to grow large in order to maintain the infection. So the capsule is a critical virulence factor for cryptococcal infection. One of the first challenges we faced, since there was uh, no existing expression data of the type we needed for cryptococcus, was which transcription factor deletion strains to make and subject to RNA-seq expression profiling. We tried several different methods, but the one that worked best is a very simple method that we call phenoprofit. All it does is it takes the net profit uh, predicted targets of each transcription factor and calculates the enrichment of those targets for genes that are already known to be involved in capsule production. Um, and we take the maximum hypergeometric p-value over all thresholds of net profit scores. This works because even when you have data from deletion of only a few transcription factors, the regression component of net profit predicts targets for all transcription factors. And hence, that those predictions can be used to prioritize new targets for uh, deletion and profiling. So putting it all together, we ended up with a workflow uh, that starts with making transcription factor deletion strains, using RNA-seq to produce expression profiles, using net profit to produce network models from the expression profiles. And from there, there are several different directions you can go. One is to use phenoprofit to prioritize more transcription factors for deletion and profiling, going around the cycle again. When you're satisfied with the network you've produced, you can then analyze the targets of each transcription factor to produce other finished network products. For example, by analyzing the promoter sequences of the predicted targets, you can obtain a transcription factor binding motif. Or by analyzing the uh, go terms associated with the targets, you can come up with a function for a transcription factor. We were pretty confident that net profit worked well based on the data from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but we wanted to spot check the network in Cryptococcus. So we looked at three transcription factors. One of them, GAT201, was the only one for which uh, chip data was available. And the Deering lab then did carried out chip seq on two others, USV101 and NRG1. And for the top 40 net profit predicted targets of each transcription factor, we calculated how enriched they were for chip positive targets relative to what you would expect from 40 genes selected at random. We found that for NRG1, the top 40 targets were um, about fourfold enriched for chip hits, for GAT201, about 25 fold, and for NRG1, also about fourfold. And then we did the same thing for the top 80 targets, the top 120 targets, top 160, and so on. And you can see the trends shown here. We also did another analysis comparing chip to net profit here. Um, and that is, we took the net profit predicted targets of each transcription factor and ran them through a motif inference program to produce a, trans a hypothesized transcription factor binding motif using only expression data again. And then we did the same thing for the chip positive targets of each transcription factor and aligned the two motifs. So you see the net profit motif here for USV101 on top and the chip derived motif below it and the agreement is very good. Um, also for GAT201, we get very good agreement. For NRG1, there are some substantial discrepancies between the net profit predicted and chip predicted um, motifs. And so we found the most, we went and found the most uh, closely related homolog in Saccharomyces cerevisiae for each transcription factor uh, for which a PWM model was available in the SRTF database. And we aligned the yeast uh, motifs as well, shown below the line here. Uh, here, we see that both CHIP and net profit agree on a motif that, diver that is diverged from that of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, here, we see the ex expected GATA family resemblance among all three. And here, the 
uh, Cerevisiae motif is more similar to the chip motif than to the net profit motif. So net profit isn't perfect. Um, in this case, what we think is going on is that it's predicting as direct targets some indirect targets via a specific transcription factor, M MBS1, that's activated by NRG1. As one example of the kind of biological insights we've been able to gain from analyzing these uh, data in Cryptococcus, I laid out here the biochemical pathways that are required to uh, make the activated sugars that are precursors for the polysaccharide capsule and transport them into the Golgi apparatus. So you see enzymes here as arrows, transporters as cylinders, and transcription factors as ovals. And the blue coloration indicates um, a molecule whose gene, uh, when deleted, results in a smaller capsule or hypocapsular phenotype. The yellow indicates a gene that, when deleted, results in a hypercapsular phenotype. So one of the nice things about this is that we can understand why some of these transcription factors have the phenotypes they do. For example, CR1 is an activator of four uh, enzymes and transporters that are involved in this process. And so it's very likely that the reason the CR1 deletion mutant has a hypocapsular phenotype is that these four genes are not being expressed at sufficient levels to make the capsule. We see good agreement between the phenotypes of activators and the phenotypes of their targets. And we also see here for USV1 that since it's a repressor of genes with hypocapsular phenotypes, it itself has a hypercapsular phenotype, as expected. Also, we were able to identify these two uh, enzymes as critical choke points in the regulation, transcriptional regulation of these pathways. So to summarize, uh, comparing CHIP and net profit, CHIP reports both functional and non-functional targets. Net profit reports only functional targets. PWMs provide evidence that um, CHIP reports some direct sequence-specific targets, but it provides evidence that net profit reports many more direct sequence-specific targets. CHIP requires a finicky experiment that has to be optimized for each transcription factor. Net profit requires only expression data, which can be produced by simple commodity methods. When you chip one transcription factor, you don't get any information about other transcription factors that you haven't shipped yet. But when you delete a transcription factor and do expression profiling and submit it to net profit, the regression component of net profit also predicts targets for all other transcription factors. When you combine that with phenoprofit, that gives you a way of prioritizing more transcription factors to delete and profile. So I'd like to finish by thanking the main contributors to this work. Brian Haynes was the lead developer on net profit. Zeke Mayer is the lead on the Cryptococcus project. Our collaborators on Cryptococcus is our, uh, the Tamara Deering lab, including especially Stacy Gish and Joe Wang. Thank you. Questions? Please use the microphone. Thank you for the nice work. Um, so looks like your methods can predict the uh, gene regulation based on the expression very well. Can, you, can your method construct the gene regulation cascade? One transcription factor regulates another transcription factor. The other one regulates target genes. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I might even have a... a, a diagram for you. Actually, I don't think I do. But um, yes, it predicts to all targets encoded in the genome. If those targets happen to be transcription factors, which we can tell by analyzing the protein sequence, then uh, we also know the targets of those transcription factors, so we're able to produce a complete network with feedback and feed forward and so on. Is it possible to use your method to identify some mode uh, transcription factor don't have no motive, but using your method to identify some target region of the transcription factor so that we can further identify the motive of particular transcription factor? Absolutely, yeah. And in fact, we, um, we showed some examples of that here in that these motifs along the top were inferred only from the net profit output. Uh, so 
we uh, can do that, and we plan to do that actually as the next step for improving net profit. You infer uh, binding motifs for each transcription factor, and then use those binding motifs to rescore the predicted targets, uh, hopefully dropping out some indirect targets and bringing up some direct targets. And second question is, do you have any ideas? Because usually the co-expression method will bring a lot of indirect targets of the TF, but uh, do you have any comments say how, why this method can bring more direct target of the, uh, of the TF? I think it's, the key is the differential expression data and the fact that um, we're not just using, calling a gene differentially expressed or not differentially expressed. We're saying how strongly is it differentially expressed? The most strongly differentially expressed genes empirically tend to be the direct targets. Now, it wouldn't have to be that way. But empirically, it turns out that the signal from deleting a transcription factor dissipates quickly in the network. Thank you. Michael, um, thanks for the nice work also. Um, the, can you use your predictions as a way of identifying characteristics of transcription factors that will make them problematic for CHIP or ways of filtering CHIP data or improving analysis of CHIP data? So, um, so that, or conversely, identify those where chip is winning and what's the characteristics of the ones where chip is winning? Uh, do you, do you... That, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't know exactly which characteristics to look at, but if we had ideas about which characteristics to look at, we certainly could do that, yes. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>